Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Tomasz Rybak and I will uh, talk to you about uh, programming GPUs uh, using Python. First, some example. As you can see, we have, uh, uh, we have code which creates an array in NumPy. We transfer this data to the device. This is executed on the GPU. So as you can see, first, PyOpenCL and PyCuda are compatible with NumPy. They can take NumPy data. They can uh, perform uh, operations on the uh, NumPy arrays. And you can write si simple, uh, simple expressions like this uh, from the Python. And uh, PyCuda and PyOpenCL will, will transfer this uh, to be executed on the GPU or any other device you can run on it. So the, uh, the outline of my talk. First, I will uh, explain to you how, uh, why we need to run code on the GPUs. How, how came uh, that we can run code on the GPU? How came that this is getting popular? Then short introduction to uh, programming GPUs and, uh, and how can we do this and uh, why PyOpenCL and PyCuda help, her, help here and uh, then some tips about performance. Uh, first, some question. How many of you have programmed uh, GPUs? Okay. Uh, how many of you don't, haven't programmed and don't know how to do this? Most of you. Okay, so f for those uh, for those of you who have programmed, sorry, but I will give some short introduction why and uh, and how it can be done. Uh, first, a uh, few words about me. I'm a Debian maintainer. I'm maintaining PyCuda and PyOpenCL packages, which can be uh, <coughs> which can be used to program GPUs from the Python without needing to use C. Uh, I'm also involved with development of PyCuda and PyOpenCL. I'm, um, I'm working at Codilime, which is a small company in, uh, in Poland. I used to work at uh, University of Geneva when I was, uh, uh, I was working on, uh, on spinning up simulations using uh, GPGPU. Uh, previously, I also worked at University of Białystok. Uh, for many years, we have, we as the programmers have very, uh, very nice situation. Thanks to the Moore laws with transistors, which were, uh, which were faster, which means that we could, we could just sit and our code would, would run faster because we have GP, uh, CPU with, with speed 100 megahertz, 200 megahertz, 400 megahertz, but now it stopped. Why? Because we approach something that uh, is called memory wall, but uh, by uh, David Patterson. He, he is a professor at Stanford. He is involved with, uh, with process develop, processor development. Basically, each transistor needs some energy to switch its state, and execution of the program is switching, switching the state of transistors. So if we have more transistors and they switch uh, and they switch at faster and faster rates, we need to provide them more and more energy. And we also need to get back this energy as the heat, which means that soon our CPUs would be hotter than sun, so it's not physically possible to, to, to have this. Uh, so it means that chip frequency doesn't uh, increase, and we need to find some, uh, some other ways to, uh, to increase performance. Another physical limitation is the speed of light. Speed of light is finite, unfortunately, uh, and it means that uh, we, have, uh, we have limit of the size of single chip because, because data must go to the chip and, must, and results must go off the chip, uh, which also is another wall. This is memory wall. We, we cannot put memory far away from the chip because, it, because each CPU would be starved for, for the data. Because it would, it would uh, take thousands of cycles to get data from the RAM to get to the, uh, to get to the CPU, which, 
which is why we have so many cache levels, so many, uh, so many sophisticated cache predictions algorithms and, and so on. So the current situation is instead of single core, we have more and more cores, 2, 4, 10, 16, on the GPUs uh, in the range of thousands. Uh, it also means that we have, uh, it is more and more costly to, uh, to keep uh, cache consistency between cores. Between, b because if one core changes some, something in memory, to, to keep cache consistency, we need to, to inform all other cores that something changed. And if we have two cores, it's not a problem. But if we have 1,000 cores, it is impossible. So we do not have memory consistency. And we, we need different programming models. This morning we had talk about, uh, about different uh, concurrency problems in pure Python. This is more, uh, this is more about, about, uh, about the uh, bottom-up approach. Uh, for many years we have this silent march of increasing performance on the GPU. Because the CPU was growing in performance, we had uh, more features, we had more, uh, more frequency, but at the same time we also had increased performance in the GPU. Because GPU, the, the main task of the GPU is to take some, some data and to, to perform some calculations on the every single pixel and, and to put it on the screen. Which means that GPU is highly parallelizable because pixels are mostly independent from one another. Uh, GPUs can uh, operate on uh, many different data types, like single numbers, like vectors, like matrices, and like image fragments, which we call textures. Uh, GPUs have also large memory, like 500 megabytes, one gigabyte, two gigabytes uh, in top levels. Uh, and they have many different memory types. Memory for display, memory for uh, memory for textures, constant memory, memory for those uh, for those data primitives. So people came with different uh, with different programming models for the GPUs. First, we had shaders. Shader is is using what was already available on the GPU. If you programmed uh, with Open GL or with DirectX. Shader is just a simple, simple code fragment, simple code snippets, which tells to the GPU, okay, take this pixel and draw it green, and or draw it depending on the light, and drawing, and draw the fire if your character gets shot at or something like this. This is very simple, but this is uh, this already allowed for us to perform some co computations. It was not perfect because we had to change mathematical data into graphical primitives. So each vector had to become point. Each array had to become a uh, texture, and uh, one-dimensional texture, two-dimensional texture, and so on. But it was possible. So very soon, uh, hardware vendors were uh, noticed that and started thinking, OK, people are already using our hardware. Why not just compute uh, unified device architecture? Which is set of libraries and uh, and helper programs to to execute uh, code on the on the GPUs. Unfortunately, only on NVIDIA GPUs. So if you if you use CUDA, you cannot switch to the CPU or you cannot switch to the uh, to the uh, to another vendor like AMD or Apple or something like this. But soon there came OpenCL. OpenCL is similar to OpenGL. It has similar concepts. It is managed by the same, uh, but the same organization, Kronos, and it can it uses very similar model. It uh, it can uh, it can have extensions. It can run on many different hardware types, not only GPUs but also CPU. So you can use you can use OpenCL to run code on many cores of the single CPU. Uh, also, there are some implementations of running uh, OpenCL code on the FPGAs, which are programmable chips. Uh, the problem with the OpenCL is that it is written in C, uh, and it is assumed uh, that code is written in C, and it is very low level. For example, 
uh, memory management is done by the uh, uh, by the uh, reference counting so you can have memory leaks and stuff like that which is quite unpleasant fortunately PyOpenCL helps here and there are also some uh, some strange uh, solutions like for example PTX uh, which is assembly uh, uh, assembly used by Nvidia basically when you create program in CUDA it is it is compiled into PTX assembly and then during the runtime it is compiled uh, to the real uh, real binary code depending on the GPU you are using whether it is Fermi or Kepler or another another CPU type. Uh, so to understand how to program GPUs uh, you need to be aware of two hierarchies. There is hardware hierarchy which is embedded in the hardware it is not changeable and it is run runtime uh, runtime hierarchy. They are related but not the same. On the hardware side we have processing element this is single core executing single thread. Uh, you cannot control this directly. You can only control computing unit. Computing unit is set of many cores depending on the hardware and it, it is just a single chip. Then you have computing device. Computing device usually consists of two, two, two more uh, computing units. For example my laptop which is very low level have uh, two computing devices. Uh, excuse me, computing device, GPU have two computing units, two chips. Uh, my desktop have 14 or something like this. So, so, so it depends. Uh, the more computing devices you have, the more co concurrent your code becomes. Then you have platform. Platforms can be provided by different vendors. For example, you have platform provided by the NVIDIA to run code on the GeForce. You can have platform provided by the AMD to have code running on your CPU. And there, there is host which is, co co which is just operating system which is just CPU which manages all of, of this. On the execution level we have work item which is single thread. Then those threads are grouped in work group. Those uh, jobs are put into the queue. So th this already have uh, something uh, E even based you can put many jobs in the queue and wait for all of the uh, for all of them to finish and we have context a uh, queue is for one device if we can have multiple device devices but queue is for one particular device so if you want to to execute jobs on many devices you need to create many queues context can have can consist of more than one device which uh, can help to manage uh, multi GPU system for example. And there is also a slightly hidden uh, slightly hidden hardware detail but it is important because <laughs> it already was reason of two uh, quite serious uh, bugs in PyQD and Py PyOpenCL. Uh, in reality those processing elements and work items are run on the warps which is which are groups of 8, 16, 32 threads which are run at the same time on the, uh, on the GPU. Uh, we can create as, as large work group uh, as we want to but GPU, but GPU uh, divides those, uh, those threads into groups of 16 threads and those 16 threads are run at the same time which means that they are run independently and we need to make sure that for example we we put some memory barriers we 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 take care about cache consistency otherwise we can have uh, inconsistent data this is uh, this is quite uh, hidden this is not obvious from the documentation but it was already cause of some serious errors in PyCUDA. Uh, there is also memory hierarchy we we can have global memory which is the large amount of memory available on the GPU. We, ca we have constant memory which is shared amongst all of threads. We have local memory which is shared, shared for the one computing unit which means that the local memory is common for all the threads running uh, for on this computing unit. 
and we have private memory. Me this is private memory uh, constant, uh, unique for each thread. Each thread ha has own private memory pool. This is the largest memory. This is the smallest amount of memory. But at, at the same time, this is the fastest memory, and this is the slowest memory. So access to, to private memory takes one or two cycles. Access to global memory takes 500 cycles to 1,000 cycles, which means that we need to manually manage memory. Usually, the, the highest performing kernels take some load, load the data into shared memory or in, uh, into local memory on, or into the private memory in the beginning and then use only this because otherwise your code will, will be very slow when your code needs always to, to wait for, for the memory. Uh, as I said, uh, we can, unless we ensure that memory is written to, uh, other threads may, may read some old values. We need to, for example, if we write something to the global memory in one step, and in next step, uh, in the next step, thread reads from this global memory, we, we do not have guarantee that we have uh, uh, that, that we read we are reading uh, the new value so we need to ensure that we uh, that the data is written uh, there might be some cache uh, but it is not required uh, new, most most powerful GPUs have some caching but not all of them uh, and uh, not all cache is not always possible because uh, because we have this uh, local memory and private memory, so we can deal without it. But but we need to manually manage this. With caching, it might be easier, but sometimes the the code, uh, the GPU management is uh, is not able to to deal this. That because if if we know what uh, if we as the programmer know what data is needed we usually will make uh, will make better decisions because compilers for the gpus are not uh, not as advanced as compilers for the cpus we do not have more uh, we do not have as long history of compiler development as uh, and data is usually hidden in the heads of the of the uh, engineers at uh, gpus uh, at G gpus vendors so there are two models uh, to get the best performance of the gpu one is task level parallelism. We use many tasks, many different tasks, and GPU can uh, execute them uh, individually. Uh, but this, uh, each task gets run on the on the single uh, on the separate uh, computing uh, computing unit on the separate chip, which means that if we want to have uh, more um, more parallelism, we need to have more chips. Another uh, another computing uh, model is thread level parallelism. Then we can have as many as many concurrent threads as we have uh, as we have uh, computing uh, units. So uh, so this uh, this is used in most cases if we want to have best performance for the uh, f from the GPU. Uh, Okay, this is simple program, uh, which I will change slightly in the next few slides. Uh, I want, uh, I want for it, uh, I want uh, to use it to show you a few, few tweaks uh, in the uh, GPU programming. First, we need to get some platform. Uh, as I said, we can have many platforms. Of course, this is very uh, naive. We we are selecting the first platform. Usually, we would change platform vendor or what devices are available. Then we get device fr from this platform. We are requesting device type to be GPU. We can have GPU type, CPU type, FPGA type, and accelerator. For example, there might be some specialized uh, specialized cards for um, I don't know encryption or uh, or computations on the uh, fast Fourier transformation and something like this. So th there are already. Uh, uh, they are not yet available, that, but it is possible from the library to request such a card. Then we create context with only one device, uh, and we create queue for this particular device. Then we create some, 
uh, some data on the CPU side, on the host side. We, we create some, um, we create uh, memory on the GPU side, but we do not yet transfer data. Then we create kernel. As you can see, kernel is written in language very similar to C. Kernel is the code executed on the GPU. So we have, we have notification that this is the kernel. We, each kernel ha need to, needs to be void. We, we inform OpenCL that we are, uh, we are getting data from the global memory. We have, uh, we have similar n annotations for the local memory and private memory. Uh, and we get the thread number. This zero is, is the dimensionality. We can have one dimensional, two dimensional. For example, we can have global ID zero and one. Then if, for example, we are, uh, we are executing code which, uh, which, uh, which for example, uh, processes the image, then it will be two-dimensional di uh, two uh, identification. And we, and we perform some computations. This is very small kernel. This uh, doesn't do anything interesting. Probably it, it will be slower to, to execute this on the GPU than on the CPU because the memory transfer will be, uh, uh, will, be uh, will kill all the performance gains, but it should, uh, it should show how, how it's done. Then we copy data from the GPU to the CPU. We run this kernel with the queue, with the shape on this data, and we uh, get the data back. Is, uh, are there any questions to this code? Does it, does it matter that this array is a NumPy array or it's possible to use a Python array model? Uh, to transfer data, uh, the, the, the large amount of data. Uh, uh, it is based on the NumPy. Uh, you need to use NumPy or, or the prim primitive types. Uh, I don't, I have never seen uh, any code which transfers Python data and f if I remember the Py, Py OpenCL source code, uh, there is even no such code which transfers Py Python array py or Python directionaries uh, to, the, uh, to the GPU, with, which means that you need to use NumPy arrays. Uh, okay. So to summarize this program, we need to compile kernels to be able to use, uh, to be able to run code on the GPU. We need to compile kernels. We need to prepare data and transfer it to the device. Then we need to run computations. And after finishing computations, transfer result from the de device back, back to the host. Uh, in ordinary OpenCL, we need to free resources, but thanks to the Py OpenCL uh, garbage collector, it also takes care of the uh, of the resources on the GPU, which means that we do not need to keep track of all the, uh, all the, uh, all the references. Python garbage collector takes care of, uh, of releasing memory from the GPU, which is very, very nice. And some advertisements, PyOpenCL is compatible with Python 3. Uh, unfortunately, PyCuda is not yet compatible with Python 3. Uh, they use different models for compiling kernels and there is the problem. Uh, this, this was the, the most straightforward uh, way of running kernels, but if we want to have some more sophisticated uh, workflows, we, we need or we can use uh, event-based programming. Basically, instead of, of waiting uh, for each kernel to finish and then running another kernel, we, we can use queues and we can use events. Each, or at least most of the Py OpenCL functions return event, and also they accept event event list, which means that we can we can uh, 
create a workflow, some even quite sophisticated workflows, and, uh, and let, let OpenCL, OpenCL implementation to order those, uh, those events uh, to, uh, to ensure that they are executed in the best possible performance. This is kind of similar to SQL when we, when we tell to the uh, database what we want but not how, how we want. So then databases, uh, database decides whether to use index or not, whether to use hash join or sequence scan or something similar. So basically we, we copy data, we enqueue, we order by OpenCL to put two, two data copy operations, then we run the program and we instruct OpenCL that it needs to run program only after this event has finished. This event is for copying data. And then we copy data back from the GPU to the CPU, ordering for the, uh, ordering to, to wait for finishing running of the kernel. This is very simple linear workflow, but it, but it allows uh, for PyOpenCL to, uh, uh, to run program by itself, and we can do anything that we want to. For example, we can wait for the last event, or we can run some, uh, uh, some loop and check the event status. Of course, this is, this is quite stupid code because it's busy waiting, but instead of this pass, we can do something else. For example, uh, say, uh, set, uh, increase, the, uh, increase some counter, uh, process user events like, for example, mouse clicks, uh, send some data, and s something similar. This also allows for the, for the OpenCL to run some events in parallel. For example, we have, here we have two, two copy operations. This kernel cannot be executed one while this copy operation is running, but, but this kernel can be executed one while, while the second copy operation is running. And new, new GPUs have separate, uh, separate specialized chips to copy data. Most desktop cards have uh, separate chips to only to copy data because copying data takes a long time and it is done quite often. Which means that we can, uh, we can in parallel copy data for second kernel and run the first kernel at the same time. This is the, the first and, uh, and most important thing th that is uh, mentioned in the any uh, performance uh, tips for the running code on the GPU. Uh, to, to achieve more, pa more performance, to have more parallelism, we need to, uh, we need to increase, uh, we need to use our hardware fully. The problem is that we, although we have large amounts of memory, this is quite limited memory, because even if we have one gigabyte, for example, for GeForce 4, 460, we have f uh, above 300 kernels, uh, about 300 cores, which means that we have only three megabytes, uh, three megabytes uh, of, uh, of memory per core, and this is the, this is the very slow memory. For uh, private memory, we have two, eight kilobytes, uh, shared memory, depending, it is uh, on on this on this card. It is uh, 16 or 48 kilobytes of shared memory, which is also not not uh, not good. Basically, memory is the most precious uh, com most precious resource on the GPU. Uh, we need also to to use to use this memory wisely because uh, because we are constantly risking hitting memory wall. And memory transfer uh, is the most, uh, is the most uh, dangerous, is, is the most danger for the, uh, for the performance. For example, we were trying to, to optimize uh, the, the simulation, the fluid flow simulation in the University of Geneva. And computations were, were doing great, but memory transfers, uh, caused uh, that the, the project failed because on each step we had to transfer data from the CPU to the GPU 
perform some computations, computations on the CPU, some on the GPU, and they transfer data back from the, uh, from the GPU to the CPU uh, to, to ensure that the data is in consistent state. And uh, computations were going fast. We tried different, different strategies of copying data in parallel, uh, copy on the envelope, copy on the fragments of data. It still, it still was slower to run this code, this solution on the GPU plus CPU that, that it was running it on this, only on the CPU system. Which means that it is not, uh, it is not always a performance gain to, to run code on the GPU. Uh, and we need to take, to take care about, uh, about har hardware occupancy because so what if we have 300 cores when we are using only three of them? S which means that the, C the, the GPU programming is not good for every program. Uh, to, to help with this hardware balancing, we can use many queues or we can use out of order uh, execution queue which means put as many tasks as possible to the GPU and let the OpenCL to take care of, uh, to take care of utilizing the GPU. We can use either many queues or we, we can use one queue, but uh, not, every, not every implementation uh, offers the out of order execution. For example, NVIDIA offers this, but a AMD a ATI for Radeon doesn't offer this. Uh, this possibility, which means that we need to use uh, many queues. And we create two queues for the same device. And then we put one operation for one queue, another operation for another queue. And in this case, we need to use events. Because if we have only one queue, which is in order execution, uh, the, the OpenCL will be executing the code in exactly the order we put this we put those orders in the queue. If we use out of order execution, the OpenCL is free to, to reorder execution as, as it fits, and we can have uh, b very bad results. And we can use many devices. It can be done, although it is very hard cu currently, because uh, Again, we are getting hit by these uh, by these memory transfers. In some, uh, there are there are some hardware uh, chips. Uh, for example, the latest Nvidia hardware ha can have specialized chip which can transfer data directly from one GPU to another GPU without help of the CPU, which which speeds up a little bit. But they are very very high level and very expensive uh, very expensive cars which means that they are, not, they are only used in the very top level systems. So, uh, so uh, from the podcast I, I've heard recently about high performance computing, uh, it seems like uh, current state of the art is not to try to, to, to run the same computations on, on many GPUs, but use one GPU for, for example, for one simulation and an another GPU for another simulation because it will make code faster and you will avoid these problems with memory transfer, keeping consistency, and so on. Uh, there are also some programming problems. Not problems per se, but uh, writing kernels like this. It's quite boring because you need to write kernel, void, all input parameters, and stuff like this. And only things that changes is this execution code. So. By OpenCL, as it, it's written in Python, it is, it is high level, it is, uh, it is uh, running, uh, it is uh, compiling kernels uh, on the fly during runtime, can help uh, us with that. Uh, Py OpenCL can offer three interesting things. Single pass element operations, which means that we execute computation, the same computation on each element, and it is independent. Do you remember the first example I gave? Multiplying uh, each element by two and adding one. This is done by the simple, uh, by the single uh, sim single scan execution. Uh, sorry, we also have reduction, which means taking array and getting one 
one value from this and parallel scan, which means uh, taking, making series. The, the, the simple example is to take sum of all elements so far. For example, in, in, in element zero, we have element zero. In element one, we have element one plus zero. In element three, we have element one and two and three, and so on. Uh, those uh, those uh, features were have quite long uh, development history because they were, were written and rewritten, and I wrote I wrote some uh, some fragments of those codes. Then Andreas, uh, the main developer of PyOpenCL, rewritten this. Then we get some feedback from other developers, and it, w it was rewritten. But in current state, they are quite quite useful, and they also allow for for uh, for customize uh, with own code snippets. So for some examples. Uh, this is element wise kernel. We we provide PyOpenCL with input with input uh, arguments. We can have as many arrays as we want to and as many as many sing, uh, sing simple uh, values, scalar values as as we want. We provide the operation. The operation is is done on all elements, and we, as the programmers, decide which uh, which element will be out output value, which element will will be used as input values, and so on. The only limitation is that uh, that we need to use i, the variable i, as the as the indexing uh, as as the indexing. And another limitation is that we uh, th that this code assumes uh, one di dimensional array. And as you can see, we, we execute this code. So this is very simple. Uh, reduction is, uh, is quite interesting because it allows for reduction and mapping. Do you know about MapReduce from Google, for example? So th this is implementation of this on the one GPU. So we can map. Again, we can get as many input arrays as possible. We write mapping. We we write reduction, and we uh, we need to provide the output type and prefix scan. Oh, it's very it's quite sophisticated, but it allows for for very interesting uh, for very interesting uh, uh, features. For example, this uh, this can be used for. Uh, uh, for um, sorting data, for uh, for for filtering tables, for example, only values larger than some value, only values smaller than some value, uh, and uh, and this is quite powerful. I do not grasp it fully yet, but this is similar to reduction, as you need to provide the initial value, the the, the ne neutral value. For addition, it will be zero. For for multiplication, it will be one. For example, th th this is value that, that starts your, your your computations. Then, then we provide the arguments, the input expression, which which is applied for all the for all the input values, and then decides how to how to map this input value into the the immediate state. Then scanning, for example, sum, we can get some passing <laughs> value. And output, which takes this value and and decides whether to put this into the output output array or, or not. Which means that we can we can get shorter a shorter array that 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 uh, that we can that that we get. Uh, and those are quite powerful uh, powerful uh, features, which uh, which allow for us to simplify our code. Uh, Unfortunately, those three do not return events, which means that we cannot fully use them. Uh, we cannot fully use them in the event-driven programming. We can wait for the uh, b before the copy, but we need to to take care of this in another way. So uh, we are in the interesting times as when it comes to the hardware future, because as as I already told you, uh, we the the era of single chip is single core is over. Uh, even it looks like we are getting to the end of uh, era of the multi core. 
because already we have AMD Fusion, which on one, one chip uh, integrates the, the CPU and the GPU on the one, one chip. Uh, uh, Intel, uh, uh, Intel engineers are starting to, uh, to predicting that soon in next one, two years, they will start providing the specialized chips with the, with more specialized, uh, more specialized uh, fragments, for example, for, for decoding, uh, for decoding some, uh, some images, like for example, FFT and uh, cosinus transformation for decoding J JPEGs uh, to, to, some, uh, to some encryption, to some code signing, to have some, uh, some code analysis and, and so on. Uh, and we need, so, so we are getting more and more sophisticated hardware. Uh, we, uh, even on the single GPUs, we have, we have almost operating systems because on the Nvidia Kepler, which was, which was, uh, uh, which was premiered two months ago or something like this, ca kernel can run sim another kernel, which means that we can have recursion, we can have, uh, we can have uh, some execution, kernel execution hierarchy, we can have some, uh, uh, some more sophisticated things, which means that probably there is some small operating system on, on this GPU because it, it needs to manage the memory. It, it needs to take care of, uh, of, uh, of kernel that the kernel, one kernel doesn't kill another kernel and, and something like this. Uh, AMD Bulldozer, for example, which is also new architecture from the AMD, have, have started to, to sharing uh, more sophisticated uh, uh, floating point units between the, between the cores. Two cores share uh, share the same unit be between them. So, so it means that we, as the programmers, need to deal somehow with this. Unfortunately, so I I, I don't assume that after this talk you will you will start writing the GPU code, but I want for you to to know that there is something like OpenCL. There is something like GPU that the GPU is much, much more powerful than the CPU. Uh, for example, already the, the, the GPUs have more than, uh, than teraflop, uh, teraflop uh, performance. Teraflop, one trillion operations per second. Uh, there, was, uh, there was this paper from the, uh, from the Berkeley University which was about high performance computing and they assumed that in 2018, 2012, there will be one chip which, which will be teraflop, one, uh, one rack will, which will be, uh, oh, I, s I forgot about the, the units higher than that. And th there would be one, serv one server which, uh, one computing, uh, uh, one computing um, farm which would be exaflop. We already have this first step. We already have one, one machine which is over tera, teraflop. But we need to program this somehow. Uh, we need developers' feedback for, for libraries like PyOpenCL because currently, for example, PyOpenCL is, is written in, in the fully open source scratch your own each manner. I, for example, I have written some, uh, some wrapper to, to, generate, uh, to generate random numbers and it worked and I used it and then only half a year ago I got feedback, oh, could you get this, uh, could, you get, could you add this feature? So, so we need more feedback for the, for the libraries and also for the standards. There are, s after we try to uh, deploy multiple, multiple platforms on, on one machine, multiple libraries versions, we start to see that there are some missing, missing, uh, missing features on the, in the, for example, OpenCL. We cannot, there is no, there is no way to determine what functions are offered by the particular OpenCL implementations, which causes just segmentation fault when we try to, re to run some code uh, compiled for, for one version on another. And we, we also need to, we also need, need to respond for, for, the, for those hardware changes. So I, I want f for you to, 
to stop seeing GPU computing, GPU computations as the niche for only long bearded scientists which, which simulate how to, how to run the atomic bomb or something like this, but to start thinking, okay, m I might be use it, especially, especially with this, uh, with this uh, asynchronous event-driven programming, and to, to start thinking how, how it changes. Because we, there are already some, uh, some ideas and some implementations to, to have OpenCL on the cellular phones. Not, not on this one, because this is too old, but, but, but this is being done. And we as the Python community need to respond to somehow. Otherwise, we will need to return to the C. Okay, here are some links to the, uh, to the libraries, to the, to the standards. And are, are there any questions? Thank you for GPU programs. Uh, with debugging, yes, it is uh, it is uh, compatible with uh, with uh, PDB and with CUDA uh, CUDA debugger. Uh, with profiling, unfortunately, not. Profilers assume that you are running the the C code, and uh, and uh, if you run if you uh, would run your uh, your Pike OpenCL code through the OpenCL profiler. It would be still useful to look for the for the op, for, for the GPU part, but uh, for the you it, you would see just a bunch of Python internal functions executions. So it would be not not useful in that manner. Can you see the inside the kernel? No. The, uh, you need to use you need to use a special uh, GPU debugger. But uh, it is uh, it is compatible. Pi, CUDA, Pi, OpenCL are compatible with those special debuggers. Okay, thank you so much for such great speech. And um, if you can, could you please uh, tell us a bit about your work at, uh, in Switzerland or something like that? Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. In, in, interesting experience, I mean. Yeah. Um, do you know more about the scientific part of or living in Switzerland? More related to your work. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, uh, we were trying to work on the uh, on the flow simulation, which is just simulating the flow of the of the fluids, uh, like for example, blood in the veins, uh, the air around aircraft, and so on. Uh, there are two. Uh, there are two. Uh, two different methods. One is mathematically correct, uh, which, which, but it requires uh, for you to uh, to solve uh, sophisticated uh, differential equations, and it is global, uh, global, uh, global method, which means that you need to take uh, uh, to look at things globally, which means that you, you cannot use it in real cases. You, it is only. For, for small cases. So there is another method called lattice Boltzmann simulation, which divides uh, divides uh, the space into into grid of small points, and you and you store few values in each of the uh, in each of the of the points. Basically, you, you store how many how many uh, particles want to move in that direction in that direction up down depending on your on your model because there are different dimensionality like two dimensional and three dimensional and you can have different models model model describes how uh, how many uh, how many values are you storing for example in, in three dimensional you can have up to 27 values because up down uh, left, right, uh, bottom, top, and and then uh, and and then uh, and then all the all the intermediate values, but it is not always required. And it, if you omit some values, you have you are getting more uh, more memory savings. So uh, the the first step is to choose uh, which model are you using. Then you need to choose the the, the grid density. And then you are using, uh, th th then you are performing simulation, which is very parallelizable because you are only looking at the, the nearest neighbors 
of of, of this point because if you have if you have in this point you have uh, particles uh, going to the right and in this point you have particles going to the to the left which it means that they will collide and that then will bounce back and you have similar um, you have very simple rules which means that they can this model can be run very well on the gpu and they the, there are some some libraries uh, there are many libraries for for this only cpu which means we are only executing this on the cpu and there are many libraries uh, used for for running simulation on the only gpu we were trying to join these uh, to, to join these uh, these two approaches to to perform some computations on the cpu and perform some computations on the gpu because on, on the cpu you can you can perform uh, more sophisticated simulations for example near the wi airplane wing edge uh, because it requires more dense grid and it requires more computations. On the GPU, you could run uh, you could run uh, much more uh, um, you could run many more threads, but they need they would need to uh, to perform more simple computations for it to be computationally computationally viable. So we were trying to to uh, to take this approach. Unfortunately, they need to to transfer data between. Uh, in each step between CPU and GPU to maintain correctness of the, of the physical solutions uh, cause uh, cause for this project to be unperforming. Did you write kernels yourself? Uh, no, no. Uh, and writing kernels uh, requires um, uh, it requires some physical knowledge and and being f fluent in. In the um, in the physics of the fluids and and uh, so, uh, solid bodies, uh, the, the physicians wa was uh, uh, was writing kernels. My task was to was to run this. My task was to per, uh, perform uh, memory transfers to 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 organize this kernel execution. Thank you.